Chapter 6 After supper, Sebastian coerced Ruth into riding double with him out to the bunkhouse to get his things. He knew it would have been easier to walk with her, but then they wouldn't have been able to ride all snuggled together on the horse, and he wasn't denying he had ulterior motives. Not to himself anyway. When they reached the bunkhouse, he saw three horses tied off there. He dismounted and then took Ruth by the waist and lifted her down to the ground. There's someone here. I'm sure it's the new hands. Let's go see. Ruth smoothed down the front of her dress and tried to tuck her errant curls back into her bun, but they were stubborn as usual. Her hair never did what she wanted it to. He grinned seeing her fussing with it. He reached out and stroked a curl behind her ear. I don't know why you try to pin up such beautiful hair. Ruth blushed, looking down for a moment. Perhaps we should see who is inside. He sighed. All right, but when we get back to the house, I'm kissing you the way I want to kiss you right now. She shook her head, unable to meet his gaze. Together, they walked to the house, and they opened the door to peer inside. Hello, gentlemen, Ruth said softly. The three men were all unpacking their belongings. I hope the accommodations will work for you. One of the men turned. She couldn't remember his name, but he seemed pleased. This place is just fine for a bunch of men. We'll be happy here. He looked at Sebastian. What time do we start in the morning, boss? Sebastian rubbed the back of his neck. He wanted to get an early start, but he didn't want to ask Ruth to rise too early to make his breakfast. 6. That sounds good, boss. Ernie, you're on cooking duty, right? A man from the back of the room nodded. Yup. I already looked in the icebox and there's plenty of food. I'll make sure everyone gets a good meal before we start. Thanks. I'd also like you to make lunches for the men to carry if you don't mind. I'll be here at six, and we'll talk about our plans for the day. Have any of you worked on a ranch before? All three men shook their heads. We'll be learning together then, Sebastian said, trying to exude confidence. He couldn't wait until he'd had time to talk ranching with some of the other men in the area. Sounds good, boss, Ernie said. We'll be ready. Sebastian gathered the things from the bed he'd slept in the previous night. I'll see you all in the morning. Help the other men get settled as they come in tonight. Sure will. After handing Ruth back up to the horse, he mounted as well, and quickly headed back to the house. After the horse was unsaddled and brushed down, he found Ruth inside, finishing up the dishes. Thanks for going with me to get my things. Ruth looked over her shoulder at him. I was happy to do it. It seems like the men are already anxious to get some work done. Yeah, I just wish I knew exactly what to have them do. I've never really worked a ranch before. Just a farm. He knew he could learn, but he wasn't sure how he was going to do it. There was no manual on how to be a rancher that he knew of. She smiled. Melvin kept detailed notes of what he had the men doing every day for the entire time he owned the ranch. Would you like to go over the most recent one? That would be wonderful. You don't mind? She shook her head, wiped her hands on her apron, and hurried off to another room, a room he hadn't been in yet. When she came back, she handed him a bound diary. There you go. I think you'll find it helpful. Melvin was very fastidious about his work, and he wrote in the journal every night. Have you read over it? he asked. No, I never saw the need. I thought Bradley was taking care of everything. Now we will have to learn how to run a ranch together. You don't need to learn about ranching, he said softly. I'll do that and lead the men. I don't want to be left in the same position if something happens to you. I want to be able to run the ranch on my own. He walked to her and turned her face up to his. Are you worried about being left alone again? A little. I didn't expect it to happen when it did, 
and it made me realize that I really don't want to have to be dependent on a man for my survival. And yet you sent for a husband? Ruth knew it didn't make sense when spoken out loud, so she tried hard to find a way to explain. I sent for a husband, knowing I needed help immediately. That doesn't mean I don't want to learn to do for myself. But you didn't really want a husband, did you? She looked up at him, at the frown, between his deep blue eyes. Want? Not really. But then I haven't had the experience with marriage most young women do. Now that you're here, I think I can warm up to the idea. He chuckled, taking her hand and pulling her toward him. Oh really? She nodded. Don't think that means I'll be a placid wife now. I'm going to be strong-willed and opinionated, but having a man to be my partner in life sounds positively glorious. He leaned down and brushed her lips with his. And I love the idea of having someone at my side to grow old with. This ranch, it's so much more than I ever dreamed I'd have control over, and I'm thrilled, but more than anything, I'm thrilled to have a beautiful wife to spend my life with. You don't have to say things like that. I hope you know that. Didn't Melvin ever tell you how important you were to him? She shook her head. No, he never did. Well, he should have, Sebastian said. You're a beautiful, strong woman, Ruth, and I hope to have a long, full life with you. Ruth looked at him searchingly. She didn't seem to believe him, but she finally nodded. I need to finish the dishes. He wasn't sure why she was hesitant, but he sat down and started going through Melvin's journal. Maybe he would have an idea what to have the men do the following morning. At least he hoped he would. Asterisk. By Sunday morning, Sebastian was wondering what on earth he'd gotten himself into. He hadn't planned to be a rancher, but somehow he was one, and he didn't know what to do. A little after lunchtime, he hitched up the team, and he and Ruth went for a drive. She wanted to introduce him to his new neighbors, and he wanted to talk ranching and Bible study. He wasn't sure which he needed to talk about more. She took him to the Johnson Ranch first. The ranch made Ruth's look positively enormous, and the house was rather small. He helped her out of the wagon, and they walked to the door. Mrs. Johnson came to the door. Oh, Mrs. Arbuckle. I wasn't expecting you. Come in. She opened the door wide, and Sebastian noticed two little girls sitting together playing with dolls. It's Mrs. Miller now, Ruth said with a smile. This is my new husband Sebastian. He's hoping we can start a Bible study with families that live out here. Mrs. Johnson smiled. Oh, I love that idea. We do a family study every Sunday morning, but it's not the same as gathering with other believers. She motioned them to seats at the table. Let me put some coffee on, and I'll get Abe. He'll be excited to talk to you about this. Ruth smiled at Sebastian and nodded. She'd been sure the Johnsons would be willing to start studying together, and she was glad this was the first house she'd brought Sebastian to. Abe Johnson joined them at the table and Ruth sat back and let the men talk. First, they talked of the idea of a Bible study, and then Sebastian asked some ranching questions. By the time the coffee was ready, there were plans in the works for meeting up at the Arbuckle Ranch every Sunday morning at 10. They would study together, and everyone would bring a dish, and they could lunch together before they all went their separate ways again. All five of the families Ruth introduced him to reacted similarly. When they left the fifth house, he grinned over at Ruth. I think this is going to work beautifully. I think so too. How about taking me to meet your parents now? Sebastian felt a need within him to mend the fences between Ruth and her parents. He knew she didn't think they could be mended, but he couldn't imagine her parents staying angry for so long. She'd married six years ago, after all. Ruth froze for a moment, before shaking her head. Not this week. Maybe after the cattle drive. I really don't think it's a good idea right now. He sighed. I think you're going to find they're no longer angry with you, and it's just you keeping you away from them now. 
And don't you want to see your sisters? I'd love to. But today is not the day. She needed to look perfect on the day she went to meet her mother, with her bonnet covering the hair that still escaped from its pins as it had when she was a child. Her mother had always scolded her for looking so brazen, and she didn't need to have that happen again. All right. But soon. He wasn't going to let it go. If she kept refusing to take him there, he'd go to Pastor Fott and get directions. He was sure the other man would tell him just how to get there. When they reached the house, he spotted a tiny kitten sitting and watching them from under a bush next to the front porch. There's a kitten. She smiled. I love cats, but Melvin never let me have one. It would help with the mice problems from living so close to the fields. Do you want that kitten, Ruth? Ruth bit her lip, considering. She'd never wanted anything more in her life than that sweet little face that was watching her. Yes, I do. He left her sitting in the wagon as he walked toward the bush and got down to lure the tiny creature out. It took a few minutes of coaxing, but he finally had the kitten in his hand, and he held it up for her to see. Is it a boy or a girl? Oh, I need to pick just the right name. He lifted the kitten's tail and looked. It's a Tom, but I don't want you naming him Tom. You need to come up with something more creative than that. I'll be thinking about nothing else. She took the small creature from him, and it seemed to settle as she snuggled it to her breast. What do you think your name should be? Oh, you're the softest kitten in the whole world. She kept it under her chin as she carried him inside and set him down with a saucer of water. She'd learn what to feed him soon. She had never had a kitten, so she would have to learn so much. Glancing over at Sebastian she smiled. Thank you. He grinned boyishly and nodded. I need to go unhitch the team. With that he was gone, but she was left with a tiny little companion. Chapter 7 Sebastian's first few days with his new crew were slow going, but they got all of the fences fixed, and they began to work on rounding up the herd of cattle, so they would be ready to drive them to market in Casper when the time came. He personally made sure that each of the cattle was branded properly as they moved them into the herd. The worry was that someone would still be trying to get a hold of the herd as they drove them. He had no idea how many people the old ranch hands had been working with to try to steal from Ruth. They all worked well together, though they were all learning at the same time. He would have liked to have at least one man with experience to teach the rest of them, but he felt as if he'd gotten all the information he could get from the other ranchers in the area. The bulls were penned separately from the rest of the herd, and he would keep them separate until breeding season began again in the early summer. He'd learned a great deal from the journals Melvin had kept and from the other ranchers in the area. Most of his heifers were pregnant at the moment, and he would sell off the ones who weren't. There was no point in keeping a non-breeding cow around. When he walked into the house late Wednesday, he heaved a sigh of relief, walking over to Ruth, who was standing at the stove and wrapping his arms around her, burying his face in her hair. He knew she'd stiffen up and then accept the embrace as she did every evening. I'm home, he said softly. He felt the kitten attack his foot, and he moved it a little, lifting it to feel the kitten dangle from his foot. She chuckled. I see that. Dinner will be ready in five minutes. I just have to make the gravy. I'll go wash up. Maybe I should do that before touching you from now on. Ruth laughed. Maybe you should. It would be nice. She joked back with him, but she truly didn't mind. She had enough aprons that it didn't matter if he got them dirty. He spun her around and kissed her. Sorry, I needed that first. She shook her head. You're an awfully needy husband, you know. I know. Sebastian rushed off to the bathroom to clean up before supper. As Ruth added the flour to the drippings from the pork roast she'd made, she thought about how different Sebastian was from Melvin. Melvin had rarely touched her after the wedding ceremony. He'd not been interested in her as a woman, 
and she had been very pleased by that fact. She had no desire to be touched by Melvin. Touching and being touched by Sebastian was something she craved. She was happy to have the two weeks together to get used to touching each other and being touched, but she was warming to his touch every time he came near her. She wanted a real marriage with children. She put a small dish with some of the pork roast on the floor for the little kitten she was still trying desperately to name. He was keeping her company during the long days with Sebastian out working. Truly, she should have had a pet long before. The food was on the table by the time Sebastian returned from the bathroom. He always changed into his banker clothes in the evening, making her feel like he was dressing up for her. It made her feel cherished. After a quick prayer, they filled their plates. Supper looks and smells amazing, as always, he said as he poured gravy over his potatoes. Ruth felt a grin spread across her face. She knew she shouldn't compare her husband's, but Melvin had never once thanked her for cooking or told her it smelled good. He had eaten whatever she fixed without complaint and gone away to write in his journal. Thank you. I hope it tastes as good as it smells. He took a bite and nodded. And you said you weren't a great cook. I've learned a lot since I first moved out of my parents' home. She wanted the attention off her and her cooking. How are things going on the ranch? Looks like we're up about 200 head of cattle from the journals, which I'm grateful for. It's hard to know with the new calves, because I don't know which ones were lost to natural causes. There are definitely enough calves left to drive them to Casper for sale, so we don't need to worry about that. The calving season had just started when Melvin died, and he was talking about it, but he had no idea of a count of newborn calves. Bradley told me there were only 50 calves born, so it sounds like he was getting ready for pocketing the money he made from them in the beginning. Are you planning on buying more heifers at market? Melvin always bought about 20 to replace heifers we lost or sold because they weren't breeding. Yes, absolutely. I need to take tomorrow and sit down with the ledgers and see what I can figure out. I may have to just start an entirely new system with what I now know about the herd. We rounded up every calf and heifer and their pen together. So, we have a real count now. I think that's probably a good idea. I'm sure Bradley hasn't been careful with the ledgers, and what information he put in would have been false anyway. Ruth shook her head. I should have gotten rid of him much sooner than I did. Well, if you weren't sure, then you did the right thing. Firing a man when he's done nothing wrong isn't right either. He sighed. We'll get it all written down like it should be, and we'll have the ranch back to where it was soon. How many did Melvin drive to market last year? Did you look at the journal for that? He nodded. 350. So, we're definitely down from last year, but I don't think it's anything that will hurt us too badly. He was annoyed that the men had been trying to cheat a widow, but he couldn't do anything about it now. They were locked up and would be for a while. Ruth frowned. Yes, we should have enough to keep going, but it will be a lean year. What does a lean year mean for us? Lean years when he was young meant no new shoes for the winter and little to eat. They had never starved, but there had been very tight years. We won't have to go into debt, but I probably won't be buying any new store-bought dresses. Sebastian nodded. He had never given her the necklace he'd purchased for her the day he arrived in Douglas, but he'd do it later. She deserved something special. I think we'll manage then. We will. We'll still have plenty of money for food and other expenses. The house and land aren't mortgaged and Melvin would buy up the land of anyone that sold and went back east, so we have plenty. We can't do that this year, but if we do things right, we'll be able to again next year. Ruth shrugged, not terribly worried about it. She'd lived through much leaner times, and her parents had been paid monthly for a full five years. She just wished someone would give her news on how they were doing. No one was willing to talk to her about them, and that hurt more than she could express. Sebastian shrugged. I've sure lived a lot tighter than that. 
I guess if all else fails, I'll get a job at the bank in town. My former boss will give me a great recommendation. Well, if that happens, then you can, but I sure hope it won't come to that. We'll be all right for at least a year. Probably two. And there's money in the bank that I've never touched. Well, that helps too. All right. I refuse to worry about it until after I've set up the accounts anyway. It sounds like we're going to be just fine, and we can rebuild the herd next year. He felt something pounce on his foot, and he peeked under the table to see the kitten try to untie his shoe. What are you naming him? He'd asked every day since they found him, and so far she hadn't had an answer. I'm debating between Milo, Maynard, and Matt, the cat. I'm just not sure which one fits him better. While she did the dishes that night, Sebastian sat at the table and worked a bit on setting up a ledger system. I'm going to need to know the balance in our bank account before I can really get started. I guess we can drive into town tomorrow and find out what it is. Is it worth the long drive? she asked. It is. I also want to stop and see your parents on the way. He moved the pencil he was using out of the kitten's reach. The little critter seemed to think it was put on earth for his amusement. Ruth froze, her hands deep in the hot water. I can't. Why not? I can't look at them and know their love for me has died. I just can't. Sebastian walked over to her and stood looking into her face, one lean hip against the counter, ignoring the sound of the pencil being pushed onto the floor by a rotten kitten. Their love for you is still as strong as ever. A parent doesn't stop loving a child simply because they disobey. They knew what you did was to save them. Ruth felt tears prick her eyes. I don't think I can. What if they tell me to leave? What if they put coffee on and ask you to sit down and talk to them? What if they welcome you with open arms? She shook her head. I really don't want to do this. He sighed. Why don't we go to see them after the cattle drive? That will give you time to adjust to the idea. You're not going to let this go, are you? she asked. Melvin had been content to have no contact with her parents. She'd been alone in the house most of the time with no one to talk to or call on. The isolation had started to make her crazy. No, I'm really not. I think you're depriving yourself of people you love by staying away from them. You need to go and spend time with them and let them know you are all right. They are probably as worried about you as you are about them. I do want to see my sisters, Ruth sniffled. All right. But we have to do it tomorrow. Otherwise, I'll think it to death and be worried about it the whole time. Sounds good. We'll stop on the way back from town. He kissed her forehead, and she leaned against him for a moment. Are you always going to be this bossy? she asked. He laughed. I don't think I'm bossy. I just want you to do the right thing. He wandered off to let her finish the dishes, and went into his room to fetch the necklace he'd purchased for a faceless bride. Now it meant so much more than it had, because she was a living, breathing person in his mind, and he loved her beyond belief. As soon as the thought occurred to him, he was surprised. He loved her? Already? He hadn't realized it until that moment, and it shocked and dismayed him. The dismay was simply that his sister still had a perfect record as a matchmaker, of course, and he was sad to have to tell her that, but thrilled for himself. He walked into the kitchen as she was putting the last pot on its hook where it hung over the sink. She turned to him with a bit of trepidation in her eyes, and he knew it was because she had agreed to see her parents. He walked to her and held out the long box the necklace had come in. I picked that up as soon as I got to Douglas. She put her hand over her mouth, as if surprised to see it. For me? It's not my birthday. Or Christmas. Every day is Christmas with you, he said softly. She bit her lip and carefully opened the box, gasping when she saw the necklace. You shouldn't have. Of course, I should have. You're my wife. 
He removed the necklace from the box and walked around behind her, moving one of her straight curls out of the way, before fastening the necklace. Do you like it? I love it. She turned and threw her arms around him, kissing him of her own free will, for the first time. He'd kissed her many times, but she'd never initiated a kiss, and he wrapped his arms around her to make the most of the moment. Kissing her passionately, he moved his fingers into her hair and removed all of the pins that were fighting a losing battle to keep her hair in place. He deepened the kiss, pulling her even closer against him. Finally, she put her hands on his chest and pushed. Not tonight. Not when I'm so nervous about seeing my parents again. He sighed, but nodded. I understand, but I don't like it, he said, a grin on his face. She caressed his cheek, feeling his day's growth of whiskers under her fingertips. Let's have lunch in town at the diner while we're there. And then we'll stop to see my parents. I think I'll feel better about it if you and I have had some time together first. Sounds good to me. We'll go to the bank, then the diner, and then your parents. You're not getting out of seeing them now that you've agreed. She sighed. I know. I wish I knew how they'd react to seeing me. I don't think I'll be able to bear it if they won't talk to me. I think they will. They have to know that you did it out of your love for them and your sisters. How old are your sisters now? He asked, wondering if there was a chance they'd still be at home with her parents. They're all quite a bit younger than me. Louisa would be 17, Josie 14, and Maisie 11. Do you know if any of them have married? He was thinking of Louisa when he asked, but Josie was old enough to marry by most standards. Hopefully her parents would agree with him that marrying so young wasn't wise. I've been to town very rarely. Melvin didn't like for me to go without him, and he usually just had me make a list of things for him to purchase for me. He thought women should be in the home. Sebastian sighed. Well, you can go to town as often as you want with me as your husband. I'll take you, or you can go alone if you prefer. You're not worried some man will catch my eye, and I'll stray? That had been Melvin's worry. He was sure Ruth was looking for someone to leave him for. He hadn't even liked her to spend time with any of the ranch hands. Not at all. Sebastian grinned at her. You wouldn't have time for two men in your life. I can't imagine you being someone who would leave when you were so terribly loyal to your parents. Ruth nodded. I'd never dream of it. I was taught from a young age that a woman stays with her husband no matter what. Good teaching. He leaned down and brushed his lips against hers. I'm going to work some more on the ledgers, and we'll plan to head to town tomorrow. Ruth couldn't help but wonder what she'd done in life to deserve a husband like Sebastian. She just prayed he was right about her parents. While Sebastian worked, she played with the kitten with a piece of string, giggling when he pounced on it. Sebastian spent more time watching her with the kitten than he did working. Life was certainly good. Chapter 8 Ruth was worried about leaving the kitten alone for an entire day, but Sebastian convinced her the little critter would be fine. He'd spent an unknown period of time living outside after all. They took him into the barn and gave him a bowl of water, and left a small opening for him to roam. She wanted him to be a house cat and not a barn cat, but it would probably be good to have a barn cat as well. If he roamed around, that would be the best for the situation they found themselves in. Once he was settled, still with no name, she moved toward the wagon. Seeing her parents was both frightening and thrilling, and it was going to happen that day. After Sebastian helped her up, they began the drive into Douglas, where they'd have a nice lunch and figure out their finances. As they drove, she babbled, sometimes incoherently, about her parents and happy memories she'd had growing up on a nearly destitute farm. When they reached Douglas, they went to the bank immediately, and she had them put Sebastian's name onto her bank account. She was happy to live in an area where she could hold land and money in her own right and it hadn't passed to Melvin's nearest male relative, whoever he may be. Why she could even vote in Wyoming, which was unheard of back east. 
The teller was friendly as they took care of putting Sebastian's name on the account and changing her name to Ruth Miller. When that business was finished, the teller slipped a piece of paper to her with the balance of the account. She didn't look as she took the slip, smiling. Thank you so much for your help today. The man nodded. You're welcome. Ruth handed the paper to Sebastian without even glancing at the total. She knew that she'd worry if it was too low, and she didn't want that pressure. No, it would be better if Sebastian just took care of it as Melvin had. They walked the short distance to the diner, leaving the wagon tied in front of the bank. After ordering, Sebastian glanced at the balance, and his eyes widened. I didn't know you had this much in a bank account. Oh? Is it a lot? Ruth was oblivious, and for once, she liked it that way. It's a lot. The men stealing isn't going to hurt us even a little bit. Don't you want to know, he asked, watching her face carefully. Not really. I mean, I'd like to know if I need to get a job, but other than that, I'm content to let you handle things. He frowned. Are you sure? I'm sure. You should buy yourself a few pretty dresses from the mercantile, he said, letting her know she had freedom to spend what she wanted, though he wouldn't give her the total if she didn't want to know. Well, that will be nice. I'll probably make a couple of dresses instead. I do hate wasting money unnecessarily. Then when we do the Bible study, I won't have to wear the same dress week in and week out. You could buy four, so you could have a different one for every Sunday of a month. Oh, that would be much too extravagant. We'll save what we can. Ruth was content to know she could buy a few dresses if she wanted, but she couldn't waste that kind of money. He shook his head. All right. Just know that you can if you desire. Sounds good. Ruth looked around, trying to catch a peek at who was back in the kitchen cooking, but the door was never open long enough for her to see. The last time she'd been in the diner, she had been convinced she'd never talk to her mother again, so she hadn't even tried to see her. This time, well, she wanted to know if her mother was there. Maybe she could talk to her privately and have an idea of what she'd face once she got to the farm. Who are you looking for? he asked, surprised. You keep looking around as if you expect to see someone. She laughed at herself softly. I'm trying to see if my mother is working in the kitchen. Then I could talk to her first. He smiled. You're nervous about seeing them, aren't you? Definitely, but I feel like if I could get my mother alone, then she could smooth the way for me. Maybe we should ask who's working today. Sebastian watched her carefully as he made the suggestion. He'd be happy to ask if that's what she wanted. No, I'm going to be an adult and see them both together. It would be the hardest thing she'd ever done, but she was going to make it work. Their food arrived then and they both tucked into the chicken and dumplings on the table in front of them. As soon as they'd finished eating, he asked if she wanted to go to the mercantile for the fabric she'd mentioned. I would love that, if you don't mind. I've got your shirts done, and now I need another sewing project. Ruth liked to keep her hands and mind busy during the day, and she wasn't one to go visiting all the neighbors. At least until they had children, she would keep occupied with sewing. She chose four different fabrics for dresses, knowing the dresses would keep her busy for a few months. She was stocked up for winter already and didn't feel the need to buy more supplies. As they were walking back to the wagon, snow started to fall. She smiled, wanting to spread her arms wide and spin in a circle. She loved the snow the way most people despised it come spring. She was happy for each snowflake. It's snowing. The visit with my parents is going to go well. It will? Because it's snowing? Sebastian had no idea what she was talking about. Yes. Snow is my favorite thing, and it's a sign that today will be wonderful, no matter what. Sebastian laughed softly. I'll keep that in mind as I'm driving cattle through the snow. Ruth grinned and clutched his arm happily. You do that. 
Snow is the answer to everything, you know. I didn't know, but it's good information to have. Sebastian didn't detest snow the way his father always had, but he wasn't giddy to see it falling either. Let's go. He helped her into the wagon, carefully stowing her packages behind the seat. Soon they were driving out of town, and she gave him directions to get to her parents' house. As the house came into view, she noticed a few things that looked new. Why there was an entirely new addition. And the house had been painted a soft blue color, which she knew was her mother's favorite. They'd made improvements on the house from the money they'd been given by Melvin. Hopefully that meant they were doing well. This is it, she said unnecessarily. Her heart was in her throat as she said a silent prayer, things would go well, and then she jumped down without help. She didn't know why it would feel strange to have him help her at her parents' house, but it would. They walked to the door together, and she knocked, clutching his hand tightly. When had he become her rock? The one she could turn to if there was anything wrong? She didn't know, but he had, and it felt so much more comfortable than anything else she'd done. She waited for someone to come to the door, and when they did, it was her youngest sister, Maisie. She stood looking at her for a moment as if she was a stranger, but then her entire face lit up. Ruth. Mama, Ruth is here. Ruth stood stock still, wondering how her mother would react to this news. Once again, she was nervous, forgetting all about the snow that was falling on her as she stood on the doorstep. Her mother came from the kitchen, looking at her for a moment. Well, come in. You're letting the heat out. Ruth noticed that the fire was roaring in the stove, and she stepped inside. I wanted to introduce you to my new husband, Ruth said softly. This is Sebastian Miller. Her mother nodded and walked to Sebastian, offering her hand to him. It's nice to meet you, Sebastian. Thanks for bringing my daughter back to me. With those words, Ruth knew she'd been forgiven for her disobedience, at least by her mother. She hurried forward and embraced her mother, kissing her cheek as was customary in her family. I've missed you so much. Mrs. Franklin had tears in her eyes. I missed you too. Now sit down, and I'll put on a pot of coffee. We'll catch up on all the news. Sebastian felt a little out of place as Ruth took a seat at the table, her face completely lit up. He sat beside her at the table, wondering if she ever would have gone to her parents, without his forcing the issue. I'm going to go get the others, little Maisie said, running from the room in a very unladylike manner. Ruth shook her head, whispering to Sebastian. My mother would have skinned me alive if I'd run that way at her age. It's strange how she's been less strict with each of us. I think most parents are that way. My four oldest siblings always talk about how mother and father were extremely strict with them, but they barely disciplined us younger kids at all. And I do mean the ten youngest. He shook his head. She laughed softly. Well, it's obviously held true in my family as well, but not as severely, of course. My sisters are not demons, by any stretch of the imagination. When Louisa and Josie entered the room, Ruth stood and embraced her sisters excitedly. Do you have any bows, Louisa? Ruth asked softly, knowing her sister would be embarrassed by the question. Louisa nodded. Just one, and Papa says I can't marry until I'm eighteen. She sighed dramatically. That's forever away. Only six months if my arithmetic is right, Ruth said, grinning. Who is it? John Harmon. Ruth frowned for a moment. John Harmon? Oh. Little Johnny. Louisa laughed. He's not little anymore. I hope not. Ruth said, returning to her seat. How are you, Josie? I'm fine, Josie said, sitting on the other side of Ruth. I heard your awful husband died. Is that why you're here? Are you moving back in? And who is this man? I'm not moving back in. I'm here because I missed my family. This is my new husband, Sebastian Miller. 
Josie looked at Sebastian. Well, he's certainly younger and more handsome than Melvin. She made a face when she said Melvin that their mother would have been very unhappy with. Ruth choked back a laugh. He is at that. She looked at Sebastian, who looked to be a bit startled by Josie, but everyone was. Josie spoke when she shouldn't. Mrs. Franklin came back from the kitchen, with a pot of tea and several cups. Girls, don't pepper your sister with questions. She looked straight at Josie as she said the words. Josie was always the one who peppered everyone with questions. Josie pouted for a moment. I won't. Ruth enjoyed a nice long chat with her mother, catching up on her father's health and her sister's lives. Are you not working at the diner in town any longer? Ruth asked. Her mother smiled. I actually realized I enjoyed working there so much that I still go in three days per week. Thanks to you, we no longer need the money. Your father is fine now, and he's out working again. He was only off work for six months, but the money you and Melvin provided really kept us going. So, you're no longer angry that I disobeyed? Ruth asked, holding her breath as she waited for a response. I was never really angry. I just didn't want you to throw your life away by marrying an old man just to help us. Mrs. Franklin shook her head. Your father and I were devastated when you left, but we knew you did it for us. We thought you were angry with us for putting you in a position where you felt like you had to marry him. Never. Mama. I only stayed away because I didn't think you'd want to see me again. Well, we were all fools then. Her mother shook her head. Now tell me how you met Sebastian. Ruth bit her lip, wondering if her mother would be upset that she hadn't come to them in her time of need. When Melvin died in March, I kept on the foreman who had been running the ranch alongside him. It didn't take long for me to realize that he was stealing money and cattle. I spotted an ad for a mail-order bride service, and I wrote asking them to send me a groom. It was the best thing I've ever done. Sebastian is the husband that I needed. Mrs. Franklin's eyes widened, but then she nodded. I guess I can see how it would have come to that. I'm glad it was a good man who came to marry you and not another one like you had to begin with. What do you mean? Ruth knew Melvin was older, and he was not loving but was he a bad man? Oh, no one in the area liked the way he bought up land after people headed back east. Her mother shook her head. It was legal, but it never felt totally honest. I see. Ruth had never looked at it that way, but she still didn't see a big problem with her late husband's behavior. He gave people the opportunity to go back where they wanted while growing his ranch. Sebastian was a banker back east, and he missed working outdoors, because he was raised on a farm. She decided it was best not to argue with her mother about Melvin. Well, then it sounds like you found the perfect place to be with our Ruthie. Do you like Wyoming? I've only been here a week, but I love it so far. I think this is where God meant for me to be. I'm glad you feel that way, Mrs. Franklin said. Won't you stay for supper? Ruth shook her head. Not tonight, Mama. We'll come back. Perhaps Sunday evening would be a better time to visit. I'd like to see Papa. Well, you two come Sunday evening then. John will be eating with us, as he does every Sunday. He can't seem to stay away from Louisa. We'll come then. I'd like to see little Johnny Harmon again. It's hard to believe he's sweet on Louisa. It is, but they want to be married as soon as she turns 18. Will it be a big wedding? Ruth asked. Louisa shook her head. No, we don't want to go to any expense. It'll be a church service, of course, but a small one. As long as I'm invited, it doesn't matter. Oh, you'd better come. Louisa said, reaching out to grasp her sister's hand. As Ruth and Sebastian left a short while later, she felt full of hope for the first time in a long time. Everything was going to be all right. Sending for Sebastian had worked a kind of magic in her life, and she couldn't be happier. 
Chapter 9 When they got home later that day, Sebastian took the time to set up the ledgers he would use to keep the ranch's business where it needed to be, while Ruth cooked supper. It felt strange to be cooking with him right behind her, but it also felt right. She was making a simple stew for supper, and as she peeled potatoes, she said, I'd really like it if you'd teach me how to do the ledgers as well. I would like to be able to handle things if you get ill. Or he died. She never wanted to be left alone in that situation again. I can do that, but you'll have to be able to see the bank balance if I do. I know you don't want to think about money, so it's up to you. Sebastian wanted her to be more involved. He would happily do the money for them and take care of things, but accidents happened every day. He needed to know she could be self-sufficient. She took a deep breath and nodded. I think it's important, so yes, you can show me. How would you feel if we did that on Sunday afternoon? That way I won't miss any work as I show you. I think that's a good idea, Ruth said. And it'll give me time to brace myself. She wasn't sure if she wanted to know the amount they had in the bank. It was scary. She didn't know why, but it was. The kitten played in her skirt as she cooked, and she giggled a little. It's a good thing hoop skirts aren't in fashion with this kitten around. Sebastian laughed. I can see that would be a problem. Not one he'd complain about, of course, but she would see it as a problem. After supper, she washed the dishes, while he did more work on the ledgers. This was the balance he'd been looking for coming from Beckham. He still got to play with numbers, but he was working outdoors most of the time. We can't do the ledgers on Sunday. We're going to your folks for supper. Her eyes widened, and she nodded. I guess we can't. Maybe you can teach me in the evenings after supper. Sebastian nodded. That works. I want you to know what you're doing with them before we leave for Casper. Anything could happen on a cattle drive. Ruth frowned. Be careful. He grinned. Does that mean you want to keep me around for a while? Of course, it does. I actually like having you around here. Because she was in love with him. She just couldn't tell him yet. I'll do my best then. It was the first time she'd really talked like she was happy to have him there. He knew at first, he'd only been there because she needed his help, but it seemed like now, she wanted him for him. That's what he hoped anyway. He had the ledgers completely ready to work with before they went to bed that night, using the system he preferred. He liked allocating money to different categories and using the budget to pay for whatever needed to be paid for. It was more complicated than some other systems, but he learned where his money was going quicker. She'd learn, though, because she had a good head on her shoulders. When he'd finished, he walked over to her, stroking his hand down her arm. How are you feeling about how things went with your mother and sisters today? Her grin was enough of an answer for him. I'm ecstatic. I think Papa is going to fall in with the rest of them, and just be happy that I'm coming around again. She looked up at him for a moment. Thank you for making me do that. I should have gone to them a long time ago, but I knew Melvin didn't want me to, and it became a habit to think they hated me. He would tell me they'd never accept me back after what I'd done. He liked to have me isolated, I think. Sebastian shook his head. Why would he marry someone he didn't feel like he could trust? That makes no sense to me. She shrugged, setting aside her sewing. I never understood it myself. She stood and wrapped her arms around him. I'm so glad to be married to you, Sebastian. I hope you know how good it is to have you here. He stroked her cheek tenderly. I never imagined I would see the woman waiting for me and know I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. The look in her eyes made him feel like she was feeling the same way he was. He leaned down and pressed his lips to hers, surprised when she deepened the kiss. Ruth stood on tiptoe and pressed her body against his, hoping he would understand her silent wish they would be able to go to bed together that night. Her arms went around his shoulders, 
and she lost herself in his embrace. When she felt herself swept up in his arms and carried into her bedroom, she knew he'd gotten her message. It was hard to say with words what was so natural for her to say with her body. Before she knew what was happening, she was undressed and on her back on the bed, looking up at him as he quickly stripped out of his clothes. When his pants hit the floor, she wouldn't let herself look at the part of him that would soon be one with her. It would be too immodest. At least that's what Mrs. Fott had told her when she'd explained she needed help to know what to do on her wedding night. Sebastian stared down at his beautiful bride, the light from the kitchen letting him see her alabaster skin. She was perfect in every way. Her breasts with their pink-tipped nipples making him ache for her. He lay down beside her on the bed, once again pressing his lips to hers as his hands began an initial exploration of her body. Are you sure you're all right with this? he asked, wanting to kick himself as soon as the words escaped his lips. What if she asked him to stop? She couldn't bring herself to answer him with words, so she wrapped her arms around him and answered the best way she knew how. The ache from her core wouldn't allow her to stop him. They'd come too far for that. As his hand swept over her, and one centered in the place she was aching so badly, she let out a gasp of surprise. She hadn't thought he'd put his hand there. Was he supposed to do that? Oh. You don't like that? he asked. Ruth wasn't sure what to say to that. I was just, surprised. He pulled away looking down into her face. But you've done this before. He hadn't, but he'd married a widow, so he knew she couldn't be as virginal as she seemed. I haven't. Melvin wasn't interested in me that way. She was embarrassed to admit it. She'd thought for a long time there was something wrong with her, that he hadn't found her attractive. Apparently, Sebastian had no problem with her though. Sebastian was shocked for a moment, but he found he was pleased as he resumed the heated kisses and strokes. She was his in every way a bride should be for her husband. When he rolled atop her, she felt only a brief moment of pain. It was all over too quickly for her to receive the same kind of pleasure he had but the experience leading up to the act itself was one she would always want to repeat. He made her feel beautiful in every way. He tucked her head under his chin, holding her close. His hand still roaming over her body. You all right? he asked. She nodded, tickling his chin with her hair. He'd long since pulled out all the pins so it would flow over her shoulders as it should. I'm good. He tilted her chin up for a kiss. Thank you for being the most wonderful wife a man could ask for. I'm not sure what you think I've done that was so good, but you're welcome anyway. Ruth closed her eyes, content. She'd made him feel good, and that was all she'd wanted that night. Asterisk. Sebastian was back out working the next day, and Ruth was a little stiff from their amorous activities. She made a special supper wanting to show him she really was a good wife in every way. Most of the day was spent cutting out one of her new dresses for Sundays, hoping she could finish before Sunday morning, when they'd have their first Bible study there in their home. They'd have to throw the parlor door open and some would have to sit at the dining table, but they'd make fitting that many people work. The house was spotless as it always was, and she enjoyed watching the kitten attacking pieces of the fabric and even once taking a piece in his mouth and running off with it. Finally, she tied a little ball out of the remnants of the material, feeling a bit guilty as she did that she would lose some of the scraps for quilting. The kitten loved the little ball. He carried it everywhere, rolling it around, and once, he jumped up to the seat of her chair, then onto her shoulder. From there, he jumped down onto the table and set the ball, which he'd had in his mouth, down onto the table and knocked it on the floor. Apparently, he decided that much work was more trouble than it was worth, and he stayed on the floor with his little ball after that. Anytime she caught him playing with it out of the corner of her eye, she would giggle softly. The fabric didn't seem like a waste when it brought him so much pleasure, and he in turn brought her pleasure as she watched him. The dress was completely cut out by the time she had to finish making supper 
and she would start sewing the following day. Perhaps she wouldn't be able to get it done before Sunday, but she was making swift work of it. Sebastian washed and changed clothes before kissing her, and she appreciated his efforts all the more. The man was no longer really trying to woo her into bed, and he was still being considerate. He was definitely a man worth keeping. When they were sitting for supper, she asked, How was the ranch today? Good. I'm amazed at all the men got done while I was gone yesterday. They're all really hard workers. When we go into town for church, we're going to have to thank Pastor Fought for his recommendations. He served his food and took a deep sniff of appreciation. Supper smells wonderful as always. You are easy to cook for, husband. Oh? Why is that? You are thankful for everything I do. Ruth shook her head. You act like every meal was made by a great chef, and it's perfect. If my wife made it for me to eat, then it's perfect. He took her hand and brought it to his lips. You're perfect. She laughed. I think you'll soon discover I'm anything but perfect, but I'll let you believe I am any day of the week. That night their lovemaking was as pleasurable for her as it was for him, and she couldn't help but wonder why they'd waited so long to be intimate with one another. Now she had no need to be nervous any longer, and she could simply enjoy being a wife. She said a quick prayer of thanks for spotting the ad. Sending away for her husband, though unconventional, had been the best thing she'd ever done. Chapter 10 Sunday evening with Ruth's family went very well. As expected, her father welcomed her with open arms. They ate together, telling stories and laughing, and her father pulled out his harmonica after the meal. We have to celebrate our Ruthie's return. Ruth sat in the new parlor, which was the room that had been added on, leaning against Sebastian on the sofa, watching her father play with tears in her eyes. Her favorite nights had always consisted of him on the harmonica. He played for hours before Sebastian got to his feet. Thank you for the music, sir. I wonder if I could talk to you privately for a moment. I have a favor to ask of you. Ruth was surprised, and she gave her husband a questioning look. He hadn't mentioned anything about a favor from her father. Mr. Franklin nodded. I need to milk the cow anyway. You come on out and talk to me while I do. Sebastian followed her father outside without giving her another look. Ruth's mother looked at her. What's that all about? I have no idea. He didn't mention anything to me about needing a favor from Papa. Well, I'm sure if we can help with whatever he needs, we will. You're not having money trouble, are you? Ruth had learned enough about their finances that she could answer honestly. We're not. That's good anyway. Ruth followed her mother into the kitchen and helped her clean up from supper. The two of them had worked together so many times in the past that it was easy to fall into the familiar rhythms. Louisa was in the parlor still, sitting with John. They couldn't seem to quit making eyes at each other and holding hands. It really startled Ruth to see her younger sister so infatuated with a young man, but she was pleased for her. They were just finishing up the dishes when her father came into the kitchen. I've agreed to let Louisa go and spend the next couple of weeks with Ruthie. It's time for the cattle drive, and Sebastian thinks Ruth would enjoy the companionship. Mama nodded. I think that would be a good thing for both of the girls. Louisa will learn a little more about what being a wife entails, and I'm sure it'll be good for Ruthie. Ruth clapped her hands together excited that Sebastian had thought of her sister staying with her. We'll have a wonderful time, I'm sure. And we have plenty of room for her. When is she coming to our house? Papa smiled. You've always been anxious to get what you want, haven't you? She's packing her things now. She just said goodbye to John for the next few weeks, and she had to shed a few tears. He shook his head. I'm not sure I'm ready for two of my daughters to be married. Mama laughed. I'm sure I am. I'm ready to be a grandmother, I think. Ruth blushed. 
she could already be expecting, but it would be a little while before she knew. I'm sure grandchildren are on your horizon, Mama. Glad to hear it. Mama said nothing else, but Ruth felt that as much as could be said had been. Louisa came into the kitchen then, a small suitcase packed. I'm ready to go to your house, Ruth. She still had red-rimmed eyes, but she looked excited as well. It would be the first time any of her family had seen her house, Ruth realized. Mama looked at Louisa and nodded. Send Josie in here, to help me finish up the supper dishes, and you two head out. It's already dark, and I don't want you having any trouble on the way out to the ranch. Yes, Mama, Louisa said obediently. Ruth put down the towel she'd been using to dry the dishes and hugged her mother, who got water all over the back of Ruth's dress. I'll see you soon, Mama. And you are welcome to come to call any time you'd like. I'll keep that in mind. You never know when I'll pop in, so make sure you keep your house tidy, Mama said with a smile. My house is always tidy. Ruth walked into the main room and hugged the others goodbye watching as Josie dragged her feet into the kitchen. She had no desire to help with the dishes, and the others all knew it. Ruth walked to Sebastian and smiled, standing on tiptoe, to kiss his cheek. Thank you for thinking of having my sister stay with me. It will be nice to catch up with her while you're away. Sebastian grinned at her. I thought you might like that surprise. I wasn't sure if I'd ask but after watching your family together tonight, I knew it was the right thing to do. I have some new books I'm bringing, Louisa said. I hope you haven't read them. Maybe one of us can read while the other sews in the evenings. Like we used to. That sounds wonderful, Ruth said. Even if I have read them, I'd enjoy that a great deal. Sebastian said goodnight to her parents, shaking her father's hand and thanking him for the favor. I can't abide the idea of leaving Ruth home alone for two weeks straight. I don't know how she managed during the time she was a widow. Papa looked over at his eldest daughter. I think she's stronger than any one of us ever imagined. I think you're probably right about that, sir. When they got to the wagon, Sebastian helped both of the ladies onto the wagon seat, making sure that Ruth was sitting in the middle. I'm glad you decided to come visit, he said to Louisa. I'm not sure I have a choice, but other than missing my John, I'm excited to do it. Spending time with my older sister has always been one of my favorite things to do. And I brought some of the sewing for my hope chest, and I'm sure she'll help me if I ask nicely. Ruth laughed. You know you don't need to ask nicely. You never used to anyway. Well, I have to seem polite to my new brother-in-law. After he leaves on the cattle drive, you can be yourself again. Sebastian laughed softly at the antics of the women. Ruth seemed so much younger and more carefree than she had the day he met her. Did I tell you I have a kitten? Ruth asked. I haven't decided on his name yet, but I'm debating between Matt the cat, Maynard, and Milo. What do you think? I'll need to see him first. Louisa replied. What does he look like? He's a gray tabby. I'm not sure how old he is, but he loves this little ball I made out of fabric. I'm working on some dresses for Sundays. We're doing weekly Bible studies with other believers out where we are. How far away did you move? Louisa asked. It'll take about an hour to get there. You're going to love my house. I have a bathroom. The sisters chattered the whole way home, and Sebastian couldn't be happier. A companion was just what Ruth needed, and who better than her sister? Asterisk. Working together with her sister made Ruth's chores not only lighter, but so much more enjoyable. Louisa chose the name Matt for the kitten, and though it was a bit odd, they both enjoyed playing with him. They took turns sewing and reading. One reading until her voice got sore and then the other one taking over. The only sad time the entire week was when Sebastian had to leave on the cattle drive. He was up well before dawn on the day of his departure, and refused to let Ruth cook for him. I'll eat with the men. 
They're expecting me. You sleep. Ruth was tired, but she wanted to see him off as well. She followed him to the door in her nightgown and clung to him as he said goodbye. Be careful. You promised. I will. We're driving our cattle with the other ranchers in the Bible study, so there are plenty of men working together. Don't fret. I'll be home as soon as I can, and I'll make sure this is the last year I have to go. One of the men can see to our interests from now on. Ruth nodded, liking that idea. After he was gone, she did all the cleaning for the day without her sister, and sat down in the parlor to work on sewing. She'd been working for a few hours when Louisa walked into the room. How long have you been up? She asked. Ruth held up the dress she'd been sewing, completely finished except for the hem. A while. I wanted to say goodbye to Sebastian and wish him well on his trip. Sounds like a good thing to do. Louisa sat down beside her. Have you had breakfast? Not yet. I wasn't hungry. Well, you can't give up on eating just because your husband is gone for a couple of weeks. I guess not. Ruth set down her dress and got to her feet. I'll finish the dress today anyway. The other ranchers' wives are still coming over at Bible study time on Sunday, and I want to show off the dress. We won't study the Bible, but we will have a potluck lunch and talk. That'll be nice. It's strange seeing you as a wife and not as just a big sister. What do we want for breakfast? Ruth asked. Let's have pancakes. Do you have maple syrup? Of course. What kind of wife would I be without it? Louisa laughed. A terrible one, apparently. Do you want to cook or gather eggs and milk the cow? Ruth asked. She hadn't had her sister's cooking yet, and she was interested to see if she was any good at it. I'll gather eggs and milk the cow, Louisa said. No one should have to eat my cooking. Do you want me to show you how to make pancakes? Ruth asked. I can gather the eggs, while you milk the cow, and then we can cook together. Louisa nodded. I'd like that a lot. I feel like Mama is always judging me when I cook at home, and there's nowhere else for me to practice. I was a terrible cook before Papa hurt himself. Remember? And then I had to cook every meal, and I was awful. Louisa giggled. I do remember that. You're such a good cook now, though. Ruth grinned. We'll make this time with Sebastian, gone all about you learning to cook. I'd like that a lot. Asterisk. Ruth had eaten several burnt meals by the time Sebastian returned, three days earlier than expected. When she heard the door open, she was in the kitchen instructing Louisa in how to make fried chicken. Be careful not to let it burn she said as she hurried into the front room. Sebastian. I wasn't expecting you yet. She flew into his arms, kissing him even though he was still covered with the dirt of the road. I got a good price for the calves, and I hurried back. The men were all eager to get back here and work as well. We bought twelve new heifers to replace the six I sold. He held her close as he told her his news. That's wonderful. I heard the Olsons are heading back east if we want to talk to them about their cattle and land. Ruth had heard the news the previous Sunday, and she was anxious to tell him. She knew he wanted to continue growing the ranch, and what better way was there? Maybe I'll go talk to Mr. Olson after I've cleaned up. Do you know how much he's wanting for the land and cattle? Ruth nodded, naming a figure that had Sebastian smiling. I think I'll go talk to Mr. Olson tonight. Perhaps he has a cowhand or two who would like to come work for us as well. Are they heading back by train? Yes, they are. That's why they're asking so much. Well, then I'll get cleaned up and change clothes and head that way. Can you hold supper for me? Ruth nodded. Louisa's cooking, and she isn't very good, she whispered. Then I'll make sure I smile a lot as I'm eating. You're a good man, Sebastian Miller. I try. 
It was a few hours before he was back for supper, already having made a deal with the Olsons whose ranch bordered theirs on the south. We're growing, he said, looking at the fried chicken his sister-in-law had attempted. Thankfully Ruth had made the gravy, and he could cover the burnt parts in gravy as he ate. He took a bite and pronounced the meal delicious, hoping no one could see the truth on his face. Ruth sat with him, chattering away about her time without him while her sister did the dishes. Matt the cat has really warmed up to Louisa. They're fast friends. Sebastian looked around. Where is Matt the cat? I think he's mad at you for leaving, Ruth said with a shrug. He ran off as soon as you walked in the door. He'll get over it. He shook his head. Rotten kitten. She grinned. He is rotten. We'll take Louisa home tomorrow, if she'd like, he said as his sister-in-law headed to the spare room to sleep for the night. He was thankful she was giving them some privacy. That sounds nice. I want to be alone with my husband again. He covered her hand with his. I would like that as well. As they talked, Ruth realized she was truly comfortable with her husband. Never had she felt the need to sit and talk to Melvin, and he'd never seemed to want it. This marriage was different from her first in all the ways that mattered. She looked at him and said, I love you. Sebastian swallowed the bite of potatoes in his mouth and looked at her for a moment. What brought that on? She shrugged. I was thinking it, and I thought maybe you needed to hear it. I did. I love you too, Ruth. She smiled. We're going to be happy together, aren't we? Absolutely. Matt the cat came into the room then and let out a loud meow to be let out of the house. Ruth laughed. I guess he's willing to be in the same room with you again, if only for a little while. Epilogue It was early on Christmas morning when Ruth got dressed. They were going to her parents' house to go to church services with them and open presents after. But first, she had a present for the man who had changed her life from one of gloom to one of happiness. When he came into the kitchen for breakfast, she sat down with him and looked at him with a smile. I want to give you one of your presents here, before we go to see my family. She handed him a piece of paper. He frowned, turning the paper over in his hand and slowly unfolding it, wondering what she could possibly want to give him that could be contained in a piece of paper. He read the words, and a slow smile spread across his face. You're sure? She nodded. I saw the midwife this week. We should have our first child around the beginning of July. He wrapped his arms around her and held her close. I didn't think God could bless me more than he already has. Now I need to do something I really don't want to do. Ruth frowned. What's that? I need to write my sister and tell her that I'm not only in love, I'm going to be a father. It'll go to her head. I just know it will. She laughed. I think you'll live through the experience. Maybe. We need to make sure our little one has lots of siblings to love and play with. And torment? Sebastian laughed. I can't think of anything more fun. <laughs>